The Russian military has not made the progress they and analysts had expected in the war against Ukraine. Estimates of Russian troops killed range anywhere from 3,000 to 14,000. And there are reports of Russian soldiers running out of fuel and food. Jeffrey Edmonds is a research scientist at CNA and is the former director for Russia on the National Security Council. Jeff, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. U.S. intelligence is estimating the number of Russian soldiers killed at 7,000. Assuming that's true, why would the number of casualties be so high? I think much of it has to do with the very poor operational planning or lack thereof that went into this. I mean, it really seems as though the Russians thought they could just drive to Kyiv and would be able to just take over the city and the rest of the resistance was, would fall. And what we saw was a very stiff Ukrainian resistance with very advanced weapons that I think the Russian military just wasn't prepared for. And so I think because of that, they didn't take necessary security measures. They just didn't approach this as, as a military would normally approach a complex mission. And that's why so many had gotten killed. Uh, so British intelligence reports that Russian troops are running out of fuel and food. First, how could that possibly be happening? And what impact do you think that will ultimately have? So I think it has a huge impact. I think that's one of the reasons you're not seeing them push more, you know, the resistance plus the logistical issues. I think a lot of this, again, goes back to the lack of planning, one. And then two, this isn't necessarily the kind of mission the Russian military normally uh, trains for. It usually trains for a war against NATO and the United States. And that's a very different different kind of, of thing, rather than this, this push along, you know, on, on land, on ground, um, into another country where it just, it just that doesn't have the logistical capability or planning to really service what the, what the uh, Russian troops need. So Russia claims to have launched two hypersonic missiles against Ukrainian targets. What does that tell you about their strategy and how this war is going for them? So there are a couple, there are a couple aspects about the, the hypersonics. Um, one, if it was an underground depot, then it maybe makes some military sense to use the hypersonic because it, it comes down from the top, it's very fast. Uh, it's got tremendous kinetic um, force behind it, and so maybe that's what you need. But I also think that this is more about Russia trying to capture more of the narrative. Obviously, as you said, things have been going so poorly for the Russians. That's certainly making it back home. And so I, I think there's also a domestic signaling aspect of this. Like, you know, we're, we're using our cool, high-tech stuff, but also there might be some intimidation um, directed towards the Ukrainians on this as well. And I believe that this would be the first time a hypersonic weapon would be used in combat. Defense Secretary Austin had said that Putin, if he in fact did use hypersonic missiles, is trying to, quote, reestablish momentum. Do you agree with that? Yes, I, I think that's, that's, that's one way to look at this, in the sense that cl Putin clearly knows that the Russian military has not achieved what he, regardless of what people around him are saying about it being on track, he knows that they're not on track. And so I think he wants to kind of take, again, take over that narrative or build more momentum into his troops um, to really try to get them to, to move forward and, and to actually achieve some of the, the military objectives they've set before them. So what strategic purpose, Jeff, is it, does it serve Russia to target civilians? I mean, maternity hospitals, schools, the theater with children sheltering inside. And, and does that level of brutality surprise you? So in one sense, it doesn't. Um, from Putin's perspective, I think that if he can't take the cities peacefully, he's more than happy to level them, unfortunately. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that there's probably a mix of Russians trying to target things that are actually of value to them and then missing, um, because a lot of the weapon systems they're using aren't, aren't super precise. But there is also the part, if they if they feel a hospital is being used by both as a hospital, but also as a place to, you know, service Ukrainian resistance or Ukrainian troops, that they won't hesitate to strike that at all. And we saw that in Aleppo um, and Syria. They just they have very little concern about collateral damage in general. And I guess the big question then is how far is Putin willing to go in Ukraine? You know, does it serve his goals to completely destroy Ukraine cities and infrastructure? So I think that's, I mean, that's the key here, right? I think we're starting to transition into a much more brutal part of this war where he is going to have this kind of siege mentality because he, he can't achieve his, his political goals there. I mean, I, there, there isn't really an end state here where I think he wins unless the Ukrainians uh, capitulate. But he can't put in a puppet government like he originally wanted to because he would have to stay there. They wouldn't last last a day if, if the Russian military pulled out. So, I, you know, to your, to your question, I think, unfortunately, he is willing to lay waste to Ukrainian cities until Ukraine capitulates. And how does this, I mean, how does Russia define success here? 
So I think that's moving. I think that's a moving target. I think originally the plan was, again, to drive into Kyiv, set up a puppet government. The Ukrainians would be grateful. They could all go home. That clearly was far from, from reality. And so I think now they might, he might settle for something less, but it would still be the recognition of Donbass, the recognition of Crimea, Ukrainian neutrality, Ukrainian demilitarization, which I think at this point, given the, the morale and, and the popularity of Zelensky, I just don't think that's a realist, I don't think those are realistic political objectives for, for Putin at this point either. Well, you mentioned morale. How's the morale of uh, Russian troops, given the number of casualties, this, you know, running out of food and fuel? Um, how, do we know how they're doing? I, I, there are a lot of indicators that, it's, that it is low. And it is, I don't think that's surprising because most of these troops were training in Belarus or other places and didn't realize they were going into combat against the Ukrainians. I mean, like for those of us that went to Iraq and Afghanistan, we knew we were going to Iraq and Afghanistan. So we were able to mentally prepare for what that means. Um, Russian soldiers were given that, that that ability. And so when you, when you, it's one thing to have ones and twos lead, but when you see a whole set of, you know, four tanks lined up fully fueled and functional with no crew, that's, that's concerning from the Russian perspective. Jeff, you've said that you don't think Russia wants to attack a NATO country directly, but give me a scenario where there could be unintended spillover. So I think the further the Russian military gets to the West, um, towards Poland, the more it becomes, fr the leadership becomes frustrated with the amount of weapons that NATO and other allies are, are providing the Ukrainians. There's a chance that I think the Russians might try to just strike targets that they believe were convoys or bases where you could have those weapons. And that would actually be intended escalation um, on the Russian side. And I, I wouldn't put that by, by Putin either. If he feels that he really can't make gains here, and a lot of that's because of the weapons we're providing, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all he, if he plays a very risky game trying to to interdict these weapons as they come across the, the border. So what circumstances, if any, would Putin use a chemical or a biological weapon? So I think, unfortunately, the, the way the Russians would, would use um, chemical weapons um, would be to clear, you know, it's it's actually militarily, it's, this is a horrible, horrible thing. It's fairly effective at clearing city blocks when you think about it, um, rather than pushing uh, Russian troops in there. There is a scenario where he, you know, if he has a, if there's a stronghold or a, a difficult urban area, you could use chemical weapons there and not risk any of your own soldiers. That's really a, kind of a horrific, hor hor horrific thought. And what do you think the U.S. response should be if that does happen? I, th I think if that happens, I mean, it, one, it just further alienates the the Russian leadership and and really, you know, condemns this 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 war altogether. Although they'll obviously play it up as, as a narrative, but I think we still need to maintain what we're doing. Um, you know, increase economic sanctions, increase the amount of weapons that we're sending across the uh, border. So what lessons should the Pentagon take from watching how Russia has carried out this war as a potential future adversary? So it's a complex question, and we, a lot of us military analysts are kind of struggling with that right now. It obviously hasn't performed as well as it, as it would have. Like I said, this is not normally the kind of war it has prepared for, and so it's, it's difficult to say that the Russian military would perform as poorly as it has in Ukraine if it were fighting NATO. That being said, it clearly hasn't performed as well as, as many of us thought it would. And so I think we just need to, you know, we need to, to take note and, and look at the weakness, weaknesses and then, you know, build our own capabilities and training and operational plans accordingly. So what effect uh, will economic sanctions have on Russian military capability in the short term and then also in the long term? So I think in the short term, I mean, Russia already had somewhat of a, of a you know, limited amount of these mo of modern weapons and ammunition has been an issue because many of a lot of the ammunition stockpiles are from the Soviet era. So they have near term problems with logistics. And in the mid to long term, you're going to see them unable to complete a lot of their modernization programs or to field new equipment. And so I think that, you know, this sets the Russian military back at least 10 years um, in, in my mind. So does this really impact how um, formidable uh, adversary Russia is to the United States? I think at the conventional level, I think we do need to maybe bring down our, our estimation of their capabilities a bit. I mean, it's hard to tell in peacetime when, you know, people like me spend hours watching strategic exercises and try to understand how good the Russian military is. Well, we're seeing a lot of real shortcomings there. And so I think that's something we need to take on board. That being said, Russia still has a lot of capabilities in its Navy and its Air Force, its nuclear forces, that it's not using this conflict. So it's it's, this conflict is, is very much about the close air support and about the ground troops. There are bigger, bigger parts of the Russian military, and you know, we need to take all of those capabilities into account as well. And I guess the question is, you know, how long can Russia really sustain this war? What do you think? 
So I think it's hard to say. I think in the coming weeks, you're going to have a, if you don't have it now, you're going to have a big operational pause because I think the, the troops are fairly exhausted. Um, they're, they, ha they haven't solved the logistics issues. They haven't really rotated in a lot of new troops. And so I think you're going to have them dig in and reconsolidate the positions they have, that they're not going to be able to take Kiev, and I don't think they will, they'll be able to take Kharkiv. And so I think you're going to see them try to reassess, regroup, um, and at least get some, you know, rest or, you know, relieve the exhaustion in some way, shape, or form. Um, because it, it appears to me that they've really kind of reached a, a, an end point as far as what they can do. They're making small progress, but it, it's pretty clear that, that the Russian troops are pretty, pretty exhausted. You know, the other side of that question, Jeff, is how long can the Ukrainian military sustain their resistance before having to make concessions for peace? So I will say from the from the outside looking in, it's very hard for us to gauge where the Ukrainian military is. What we can infer is that they are still a very viable resistance because the Russians aren't able to, to push into the cities. What we don't know and don't have a good feel for, honestly, is, is how long they're able to do that. But the one thing they have on their side is they do have morale. They might be exhausted, but they have they have purpose, right? Which is so important for individual soldiers. These guys are defending, these men and women are defending their their homeland and so there's a there's a moral sense to this that i think helps carry them carry them through and is there anything else jeff that the united states can offer the ukrainians by way of military assistance that we haven't already so i think we're looking at more advanced air defense uh, systems and i think that's a, that's a really good way to go the, i mean the javelin the anti-tank weapons we're giving them are some of the most advanced out there so it's hard to go above that but i think we might be able to help more with air defense it's already the, the lower altitudes are already very hard for the Russians to operate in. We might be able to give them some stuff that would target higher altitude um, aircraft and that just increasing the amount of pain that, that the, the Russians are feeling as, as they do this. All right, Jeff, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.